Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, it's Friday, July 23rd. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. 300, 500, 700, and now 1,200 plus. County COVID cases exploding the past few days, and tonight the county says there were 1,264 new cases locally. But is there reason to worry? KPBS reporter John Carroll begins our coverage with some perspective from local health and civic leaders. The numbers from this past week in San Diego County are concerning. High to begin with, but that slight dip on Tuesday turned around in a big way Wednesday. And Thursday's number, 1,264? That's a spike that makes you wonder whether we're headed back into the dark days of this pandemic. Don't panic, but I think it's reasonable to be more cautious. Infectious disease expert Dr. Christian Ramers with Family Health Centers of San Diego says it's perfectly understandable to get a bit freaked out at those rising numbers. Thursday's case count the highest since February 5th. But he's quick to add that we're in a very different situation today than we were before vaccines. This spike in cases is almost entirely among the unvaccinated. Raymer says for vaccinated people, especially with the more contagious Delta variant, the rising numbers mean it's time for some extra caution. We need to be smart about what risk uh, behaviors we have, uh, about spending more time outdoors, and about wearing masks when you're in a situation with more contact with other people. Because of the vaccines, Raymer says it's highly unlikely that we'll see our health care system stretched to the breaking point, as it was during the height of the pandemic. That might explain why the county isn't changing its reaction to the situation here. No one from the county was available to go on camera, but we did get a couple of statements. From Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, the county is still following guidance from the CDC and state, along with a renewed urgency to getting the vaccine. From Supervisor Jim Desmond, the local health care system is in good shape. And also a reminder that the vaccine is how we defeat this virus. As for Dr. Ramers, he says we're probably going to have to get used to living with COVID like we do with the flu. We're going to live in a world where it's not a big deal for people that are vaccinated and protected. They have a mild illness. It might even get to the point where it's just a sniffles or a cold um, as people develop more immunity. One positive note, Raymer says we're seeing a small uptick in vaccinations, maybe an indication that as the numbers rise, unvaccinated people are finally taking this disease seriously, a disease that's taken the lives of more than 600,000 Americans. John Carroll, KPBS News. The mask mandate for schools in San Diego is being challenged by parents who say they should be a choice and not a requirement. The Let Them Breathe group of parents is suing the state saying masks hurt social, mental and physical health of kids. Let Them Breathe filed a lawsuit in San Diego Superior Court with the statewide group called Reopen California Schools. Those who support masks in schools say that mask wearing allows schools to offer full time in person instruction to all students, regardless of vaccination status. Let Them Breathe has about 13,000 members in the state of California. Although there are no mandated guidelines in place, a deli in Fallbrook is temporarily shut down due to a possible COVID exposure. As KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne shows us, hospital officials say the owner made the right choice. Dominic's Sandwiches, an Italian delicatessen in Fallbrook, has been open for 38 years. On Thursday, the owner, Dominic Rossi Jr., decided to temporarily close the deli, although there are no mandated guidelines. One of his employees had contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. I care about my customers, you know, not just my business, but my customers and my employees. And I thought it was important to be sure that we were doing the right thing because, uh, you know, there's an influx coming in of, of the new variant and... Everybody's 
kind of blowing it off and pretending like nothing's going on. But the reality is that people are still getting sick. So far, all Delhi employees have tested negative for COVID-19 and they plan to reopen on Monday. Dr. Omar Kawaja, the chief medical officer for Palomar Health, thinks Dominic made the right choice to close temporarily. We see the patients who are still coming in unvaccinated. We are still seeing people go to the ICU. We are still seeing people who are dying from COVID. Um, so for us, it's very near and dear to our hearts. And, and anyone who feels like they want to be uh, protective of themselves, of their customers, of um, you know their employees, uh, you know, we applaud that. Dr. Jean Ma is the chief medical officer at Tri-City Medical Center in Oceanside. I do think that we're going to have uh, a few more restrictions put back in place as you're starting to see some counties go back and say, no, when you're indoors, you do need to mask. Um, those are the types of things that are very effective. Although Dr. Ma doesn't predict a full shutdown, he says the new wave of Delta variant COVID cases is starting a new pandemic. Unfortunately, this has uh, truly become a pandemic of the unvaccinated at this point in time. What we're seeing is these massive surges relative to what we had a few weeks ago, um, almost exclusively in those that are unvaccinated becoming hospitalized. Dr. Massa's Tri-City Hospital at one point had zero COVID hospitalizations. They are now averaging between 8 to 11 cases. We'll see whether Delta continues to spread through, which is what we're largely anticipated. Um, we don't expect that this is the end of it. Um, we don't expect that we've seen the peak here. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. A reminder, everyone age 12 and older may be eligible for a vaccine. For more information about vaccinations and where to get one, visit our website, kpbs.org, and click on the vaccines link right on our homepage. San Diego environmental activists gathered this morning in the polluted Tijuana River Valley. KPBS reporter Melissa May spoke with some who say the county isn't adequately responding to the crisis. Volunteers were on site by 8.30 a.m. and equipped with N95 masks, gloves, rubber boots, trash grabber tools, and shovels. They say they're responding to an environmental emergency. The Tijuana River Valley might not look like a public health crisis, but a grassroots cleanup crew would say differently. They'd say it's ingrained in the valley. Victoria Brunica grew up in Spring Valley and is the Spring Valley cleanup crew founder. She says she created the cleanup crew because San Diego County officials haven't taken appropriate action. Although the county has declared a public health crisis, we are demanding that they declare a state of emergency because after they declared the public health crisis, they opened up a campsite along the river and they've told none of the people staying here how toxic it is. The issue has taken on a greater urgency since late April when the Tijuana River Valley Regional Park Campground opened just a mile south of the cleanup site. District 1 Supervisor Nora Vargas addressed the environmental concerns during the April campground opening. For many years, we've had a lot of challenges with, uh, with our sewage and, and the contamination from, from Mexico. But this is one of the ways where we continue to highlight uh, the beauty of this valley and making sure that, that you know, what's important to note is that uh, the soil has been tested. This is a safe campground for our communities. Adam Cooper was one of the volunteers at the cleanup and an atmospheric chemistry PhD student at UCSD. He described what happens to the valley when it rains. This is the Tijuana River, which tracks a lot of runoff from the city, wastewater, stormwater, crosses the border here, kind of like drains out in these big sweeps. Um, and then now during the summer, it's all dry. And so the trash just kind of sits here and digs into the soil. Cooper says he has conducted lab tests on water samples from the valley and is concerned about the chronic toxic exposure to the surrounding community. Analyzing some of the samples we collected, we're seeing pesticides, we're seeing a lot of pharmaceuticals, we're even seeing like illicit drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin pop up. Abernica says evidence of the toxic toll abounds. People are dying. The community gardens here um, aren't producing food that people can eat now and like all the surrounding areas we feel are no longer habitable. Members of the crew say they'll continue to host cleanups. Melissa May, KPBS News. 
A fix to stop sewage flowing from Mexico into the U.S. is in the works. Coming up on Evening Edition, why the permanent solution could still be years away. A newly released city audit finds former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner's administration failed to follow best practices and conduct due diligence in multi-million dollar real estate deals. The audit was first reported by the San Diego Union Tribune. It details four purchases under Faulkner's leadership totaling $230 million, and that includes 101 Ash Street. That building was only used by city employees for a few weeks because asbestos was found. The audit faults Faulkner's administration for leaving out or misrepresenting key information in the deals. Plans to put protected bike lanes on 30th Street in North Park are near completion. KPBS North Metro reporter Andrew Bowen checked in with cyclists and business owners to get their reviews. Just a few months ago, 30th Street was only for the bravest of cyclists, those willing to share a lane on a busy thoroughfare with cars zooming by. Now, cyclists have their own lane, protected from traffic with a painted buffer zone, plastic poles, and in some places, a line of parked cars. It's so relaxing, um, and I really feel like, you know, I can ride forever. North Park resident Marissa Tucker Borges says the difference is night and day. And the places where they were able to add additional parking back in, that parking really feels quite protective and actually adds as like an additional barrier. So I think overall in terms of like the compromises that were made with the community, I feel like they did a really solid job. Currently, the bike lanes stretch one and a half miles from Juniper Street to Polk Avenue. In a few months, the city plans on extending them north by another mile to Adams Avenue. The design isn't perfect. On a quick ride up and down 30th Street, we had to weave into traffic to avoid a UPS truck parked in the bike lane. But Tucker Borges says there's time to make improvements. I have seen uh, beautiful designs with planters. I've seen beautiful designs with cement or trees. Um, so I think that as this corridor evolves and as this corridor changes, I think there's tons of opportunity to I would love to see a lot more greenery. We did get one Yelp review that said parking is a challenge. Lara Worm owns Bivouac Cider Works on 30th Street. She says she feels for her fellow business owners worried about how the loss of street parking will impact their livelihoods. But she notes there's an underutilized parking garage on 30th Street with some of the cheapest rates in San Diego. And even with less parking, last weekend during Pride, she got more business than any time since the pandemic. This is a compromise. We need to share the roads, we need to share the neighborhoods, and we need to plan for progress together. And so it doesn't do anyone any good to be fighting. It doesn't do anyone any good to, you know, hate bikers or hate businesses. You know, that, that just doesn't make sense because we need each other. Many residents and business owners don't share Worm's optimism, and a lawsuit challenging the project is ongoing. Meanwhile, cyclists are planning a group bike ride on August 1st to celebrate the new bike lanes. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Firefighters are battling 83 wildfires across 13 states. The flames charged, charred more than a million acres and counting. All the smoke is causing poor air quality across the nation. As Isabel Rosales reports, it's taking a toll on firefighters and an incoming heat dome is expected to make their jobs even harder. Oregon's bootleg fire has more than 2,000 people under some form of evacuation orders. It's unfortunate to report that we're actually Oregon's number three fire in the state's history. Scorching over 400,000 acres. It is 40% contained. It's not all bad news. Um, so in the last couple of days, the fire has only grown uh, 1,000 acres per day. Uh, and for a fire of this size, um, basically that's, that's a really strong signal that fire behavior is moderating. But for the nearly 22,000 firefighters on the ground, there is hard work ahead to control 83 wildfires. And it's going to take a lot more boots on the ground to get this under control. It's taking a toll. Nine firefighters have been infected with COVID-19. Another alone in the blaze for nearly three hours last weekend after he got separated from his crew. Thank you to all the firefighters. Very emotional. California's Tamarack Fire near the Nevada line has grown and is just 4% contained. All the smoke stretching far beyond the West Coast. On Tuesday, New York City saw its worst air quality reading in 15 years. 
it has since improved. But unhealthy air remains in place for millions across the Midwest and Southeast. To make matters worse, a significant heat wave is forecast for next week. Wood burns a lot hotter when it's dry. So when the fire gets started in those conditions, there's, there's simply a tremendous amount of energy that gets released from the fire. Isabel Rosales, KPBS News. We're talking about that forecast across Southern California. Meteorologist Chris Nallen with you and seasonable temperatures will be on tap tranquil near the coast, but we're watching a low pressure to the east that could trek a little bit to the west, believe it or not, and bring in some unsettled weather for parts of California, but it doesn't make to the coast that we have to see. But tonight, upper 60s, partly cloudy skies around the metro. Look at these numbers there around, say, Ramona at 57. Nice looking night there. San Diego, like I said, into the 60s, Chula Vista, mid 60s. Brago Springs, a little toasty into the low 80s. So future forecasts does show that marine layer that's going to be moving back into San Diego points south here as we head into the morning hours. But we'll see a lot of sunshine uh, farther to the east. A lot of sunshine developing into the afternoon hours. Could be some clouds mixed in though. Borrego Springs and Mount Laguna though as we see some of those clouds from that low pressure drift in. But I think most of the area stays quiet for the time being. Now the second half of the weekend, that's where we have to watch this pocket of heavy rain. It's going to be very concentrated around Vegas and Phoenix. So if you're flying from San Diego to Vegas, especially into the Phoenix metro, hop in one of those short flights. Guess what? You may bump into some delays because of some of those heavy rain showers that will be in place. But watching this low drift a little bit to the west does bring in the chance for some showers. And I'm thinking at this point, probably on Monday for the coast. But for the next couple of days, we're looking good into the mid 70s here. Inland spots look good. How about mid 80s Saturday going into the upper 70s on Sunday? So a touch cooler inland and then maybe a shower in the morning by Monday. Mountainous areas. We're looking all right. Numbers will be quite comfortable. Cool weather on Sunday, even cooler on Monday with a late day thunderstorm possible. Heading into the desert, we see those temperatures climbing Saturday at 107, but then notice the numbers taking a dive as we head into Sunday and then Monday. There's a possible for a shower or thunderstorm later in the day. For KPPS, I'm Chris Nell. The Scripps Institution of Oceanography is building a $35 million hybrid research vessel that will help students study the impact of climate change. A unique hybrid propulsion system will allow the craft to run three quarters of its mission without using diesel power. Power will come from hydrogen fuel cells, making it a zero emission craft. State Senator Tony Atkins ushered the bill through the legislature. Today is a good day for us, a good day, because we will continue to be setting the trend for others, not just across uh, our nation and California and up the coast all the way past Oregon and Washington, but really as a global impact, working together to make sure that our planet remains safe. The new ship will take three years to build and replace a 40-year-old vessel that's nearing the end of its service life. University officials say the new ship will help the school reach its goal of being carbon neutral by 2025. A recent statewide water quality report found San Diego South Bay has two of the state's most polluted beaches and renegade cross-border sewage flows are to blame. As KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson explains, federal help to fix the problem is coming, but not right away. It was a bright morning at the Chula Vista Bayside Park when local politicians delivered good news early in 2020. That we have successfully secured $300 million under the Border Water Infrastructure Program to aggressively address the cross-border pollution from the Tijuana River Valley. Billions of gallons of sewage-tainted water had been flowing into the United States for months, and locals were hopeful with the news because signs warning of polluted ocean water go up in Imperial Beach even in the normally dry summer months. But that optimistic news was announced nearly 18 months ago. Three of the politicians present, Kevin Faulkner, Susan Davis, and Greg Cox, no longer hold public office. And the Environmental Protection Agency has yet to decide how to spend that $300 million. In August, we hope to identify the preferred project alternatives. Tomas Torres is the director of the Water Division in the EPA Region 9 office. And, and once we do that, they will undergo a pretty comprehensive environmental analysis. 
San Diego County officials have identified 27 possible projects to control the flows. The largest is a new sewage treatment plant capable of treating 163 million gallons of tainted water a day. This would be in the U.S. It would capture these flows and we're looking at various treatment capacity options of what size that plant should be to provide the most protection at the optimum cost benefit. Um, as you probably know, infrastructure in the U.S. is very costly. A plant would cost more than $300 million that's set aside in the EPA's budget, requiring local officials to find more money. And some of that $300 million in federal money could end up paying for some projects in Mexico. We're analyzing projects that would make improvements uh, to Tijuana's wastewater conveyance system in order to reduce uh, sewage from entering the Tijuana River in the first place. That has roiled some San Diego clean water advocates who fear that money spent south of the border is ineffective. They want the projects built on the U.S. side. The contamination issue is nothing new to San Diego County District 1 Supervisor Nora Vargas. She's worked to fix the problem for decades. The Juana River Valley contamination is not a San Diego District 1 issue, and it's not a Tijuana issue. This is a global, international issue that we need to address together, and it's going to take all of us um, coming together. Vargas convinced the Board of Supervisors to declare the situation in the Tijuana River Valley a public health crisis, the first time it's been considered more than an environmental issue. I actually feel that things are starting to move forward. But Vargas also acknowledges that the problem won't be fixed by the end of this year or even next. EPA officials expect to unveil their preferred alternatives next month. And the EPA's Tomas Torres says that will start the clock on mandated environmental reviews, meaning there will be no shovels in the ground anytime soon. Even though it, it is a relatively lengthy process, We've been able to cut that down to less than half the time it normally takes. That won't help this summer, next summer, or even the summer after that. Imperial Beach Mayor Serge Dedina says short-term relief may come from state, federal, and local officials who are working on some smaller projects in the region, or relief could come elsewhere. You know, at this point, it all depends on Mexico. If Mexico really wants to respect the ocean uh, and, and not dump sewage along the beach, we'll have a good summer. But if they continue to do what they do, which is dump sewage everywhere on the Tijuana River as well as along the beach, then, you know, it, it could be an unhappy summer for us. Dedina is hopeful about the EPA's movement. But if the agency's efforts stall, local municipalities and clean water groups could revive federal lawsuits seeking to force the government to clean up the problem. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, the COVID Olympics, a nearly empty stadium for opening ceremonies, recent cases among athletes, and protests outside. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. The Olympics are finally open. Japan's Tokyo Tower was washed in lights of the Olympic colors today as the 2021 Summer Olympics kicked off after a year of pandemic-related delay. Tennis star Naomi Osaka had the honor of lighting the iconic cauldron with the flame that came from Greece. Even though competitions have been taking place this week, the Games were not considered officially open until the opening ceremony. Unlike Olympics of years past, the stadium in Tokyo was almost empty. The San Diego Convention Center will be back in business next month with the return of in-person events. SDSU's Miro Kopik tells more about this important step in our recovery for the Friday Business Report. The Convention Center has over 30 conventions booked between August and December so far, which is fantastic because, yes, now for two years in a row, uh, Comic-Con fans are having withdrawal symptoms uh, as Comic-Con opens today. But fortunately, one of the big events in the fall is going to be a Comic-Con special edition, which is right after Thanksgiving. San Diego had to cancel for the 2020 and, and through today over 150 conventions that were either canceled, postponed, or, or, got, or went virtual. And, and one of the reasons why San Diego is, is more confident in moving forward is that San Diego County has a 71% vaccination rate. And for those over 40, it's over 80%. So, you know, we are one of the most highly vaccinated counties in the entire, not just in the state, but in the country, which is fantastic. 
It's a sight we haven't seen in a while downtown. Superheroes and villains are gathering outside the convention center holding their own mini Comic-Con celebration. We wanted to put this all together for everybody who missed last year. This is our give back to the San Diego community. Chris Canole, or Dude Vader, as he calls himself, helped organize the cosplayer community shrine as a way of keeping the spirit of Comic-Con alive. For a second year, the convention organizers put together virtual workshops that anyone can log on to. That's something many fans are hoping will stick around once the in-person convention actually returns. And I actually liked the fact that more people got to attend online and virtually versus in person because it's so hard to get a ticket to this particular show, if you will. And um, I really, really liked the fact that they were continuing with that. And I'm hoping that next year maybe they do some things online as well as, you know, um, in person. The cosplayers will be outside the convention center through the weekend. A blood drive and a small costume parade are also planned. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great weekend. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you.